so uh, my name's Mark. I am uh, a biotechnologist by background. So my PhD is in biochemistry mostly. And uh, the natural sciences are um, the most modest of all the sciences. Basically, we don't know how loads of shit works. Right? We're not ever so sure how water gets to the top of trees. We don't know if trees can communicate and have memory for collecting water. I did look that up. Um, we don't really know how intelligence works. I do know how to delete history from Alexa, if anyone's <laughs> interested. <laughs> OK, so I spoke at this event um, last year. And uh, on a, a slightly different subject, I'm, I'm very interested. Um, I, I, I retro justify my, um, my career by saying that, because I worked in biotechnology, which is a Frankenstein science, the interface between the carbon and the silicon, that actually the thing that interests me most is the way that, that machines interact with human beings. And as a consequence, I've collected around me in a, in a company, um, my company is called Contact Engine. I employ 60-odd um, people. I choose the word odd deliberately. And uh, we're based in, uh, in London, in Shoreditch, hence the tattoos and unusual hair and, uh, and McLean in Northern Virginia, and most recently in Bletchley Park. I'll come back to Bletchley Park if I have, uh, have a chance. And uh, my company is all about automating communication for very large businesses. So I work with companies like Verizon, AT&T, TELUS in the US and, and, and Canada. In the UK, companies like um, British Telecom. But I also work with utility businesses, like Centrica. I work with banks, a Dutch bank, uh, who are here today. And, uh, and also a little bit in the insurance industry and retail and deliveries as well. So quite a sort of eclectic bunch of businesses. Decent revenues growing very rapidly, but I don't want to talk about that. What I do want to talk about is, is the relationship between data and humans and something that we're calling rapport. Uh, rapport as a word is an interesting one. I wrote down a definition. Uh, but it's the uh, close and harmonious relationship between people. Um, uh, and it's based around understandings of feelings and ideas and communicating well. And what interests me about communication is Adrian and I do know each other. I know each other for some years. So even though we haven't met for a while, there's stuff I remember about him. And that informs the conversation that I then have. Now, it is entirely reasonable in the world of, uh, of automated communication to do something very similar, to learn from prior engagements, to inform later engagements, and to have personalised um, personalized conversations. And the thing that, um, that fascinates me most about the world I operate in uh, is captured in that small phrase. If I have to go to a brand, if I have to go to a website and engage with a, a chat bot, if I have to make a telephone call, I'm normally quite pissed off at that point because I don't feel as I should have had to do that. I'm really, really busy. So what my business is dedicated to doing is communicating with people either just prior to something happening or before they even know that there's a problem. <coughs> So proactive communication around things like outages or bill shock, or it might be around an appointment event or a repair event or a delivery event of some sort. And if you communicate using all channels available to you, that might be a text message, a phone call, instant message, it might be collecting and receiving video, photos, it might be in an app, it can be any of those things and all of those things. If you do that, you have a chance of reaching people, making them happy, stopping them doing the inefficient thing of picking up the phone, uh, which is very expensive to, to, to deal with, and you're on the back foot because people are mostly pissed off when they do that, then you can give better experience and you can prove it. Now, we've been doing this for years. So working with companies like Verizon and AT&T, no one's ever explained this to me. Verizon do the right-hand side of America, AT&T the left-hand side of America, but collectively they have about um, uh, 250 million customers. So we have a vast amount of data. We communicate across all the channels I mentioned, and we collect vast amounts of information. And we're a transaction model, OK? So we get paid for a reply. Now, that, that keeps us really honest. We don't get in the world of spam because we wouldn't get paid on that basis. So we are interested in, in, in communicating with people who want to be communicated with and then getting responses from them. And this world is largely absent in terms of, of real innovation. So a lot of the innovation that's happened, in, and you've heard a lot of this, and I'm about to take the piss out of this, um, uh, so on the, it, it most focus is on inbound. What's happening? How do, how do we deal with the inbound inquiry? And then things like chatbots. Um, as a lovely phrase, are you familiar with the notion of containment rates as a means of, uh, of gauging success of a chatbot? 
Uh, so this is the idea that you contain human beings and stop them reaching other human beings because it's a much more efficient way of doing it. But containment, going back to my background, the natural sciences, containment is normally associated with a virus. Right? <laughs> Customers are not viruses. So there's lots and lots of research that happens. Sorry. Let me put that back, otherwise this won't work for the cameraman. Lots of research in that area, very little research on the, on the right-hand side. And I think it's because a lot of, there's a lot of vested interest in perceit license models. You want to keep a human being sitting in front of a CRM system or a decision engine or what have you, and that's how you get paid. You do not want your software to rise up and begin communicating and doing what would otherwise be done by a human being. But that's what we do, okay? So we're in that big cross area there. Uh, this is the bit where I slightly take the piss out of chatbots. Um, so uh, I love Gartner. They always predict things three years in advance, and they use a slightly odd number. Not 65, not 60 or 70, 64. They should have gone 64.3. Then you would have really genuinely believed this is proper research, right? So <laughs> by 2022, 64% of uh, customer interactions will be self-service. And what's not to like about that? What, what is not to like? What, it is great, isn't it? You can go to a web resource of some sort and you can ask questions and you can get answers and you're happy. It's effective, it's easy, and it's efficient. All right? But what happens in that situation is that bots are focused on that moment. You, you've gone to ask a question about your flight, for instance, and you've got an answer about your flight and your flight is now delayed because there's a bloody great big storm heading London's way at six o'clock that day. <laughs> and there's lightning, and it's very frightening. That's happening to me later on today. Uh, and, and it will tell you your flight is delayed or on time, okay? The next time you go back, it will have forgotten all of that. It will have no idea that that happened. It's lost any kind of context, okay? It doesn't remember, it doesn't, why would it? It's not doing that, it's solving a particular task in hand. So I'll try to give you an example of uh, something in, in principle. So this is the task in hand. So this is an example because there's a lot of people from telcos and we do a lot of work in telcos. I thought I'd stick with that. So here is a, a, an example of some nice natural language understanding on intents. So I'm interested in upgrading my handset. So your machines churn away and they work out that that's an upgrade journey and you reply in an automated fashion with your bot, you're eligible for an upgrade what handset do you want, and they say the handset they want, and they've spelt it all correctly, and it's all lovely, and then you fire back at them the three different options, and they say B, or they speak B, or what have you, and everything is fine and dandy, right? And that's fine, that's okay, but what about a world where you can contextualize the conversation? What about something that's rather more advanced, more interesting? So I'm still, still the same question, but the contact has been made in such a way that you know what handset that person's already got. You know what data they've used. You know what experience they've had. You might know what voice of the customer or MPS score has been given. You might know how long they've been with you. You might know, not might, you do know all of this information. You might choose to not collect it together very nicely, but you will know this information. So if you collect all that information together and communicate rather more elegantly, you can go into a much more nuanced, personalized conversation with that customer. So it looks like you've got an iPhone 6. The XR would be great. It looks like the 10 gig plan would be ideal. But we know we've shafted you on your broadband recently, so we're going to give you a little bit of a discount. OK? Uh, how does that sound? And then again, you go back to your NLU, and people say about 30% of the communication my company gets back is non standard. It's words that people use to describe happy, great, man, lovely, yes, yay, all those kind of things, right? That's quite an easy thing to do. The more advanced the conversation, the more complex your NLU needs to be, but nevertheless, you will be able to recognize the word perfect, and then you can, you can close that with some other message, okay? How does this work? How does human computer rapport work? And there's a little tiny, very short video with no sound that will come up next, I hope. You recognize the intent. Those are the response parameters. You go to your data, you give a response, and that resp notice the colors that correspond to the data. It's beautiful, very quick. So that is how you gain that response. So you've looked at various things and you've formulated a sentence response based on the individual 
request in the first instance. This is rapport. This is an understanding of the past. This is empathy. It's not. It's just computing, right? But nevertheless, the conversation is personal, not a sort of generic persona-based conversation, but actually an individual-based conversation. Now, if you take that to its ultimate end goal, if you are a company with 10 million customers, why do you not have 10 million different conversations? Right? All the technology exists to allow you to do this, and why can you not layer into those conversations all these other pieces of information that I've described? And have conversations that are different and unique to the individual, and tie that individual to you for longer. Another Gartner statistic, those who weren't concentrating that day and decided to go for a round number, so 40% of customer service cases would be predictable. I can tell you it's not 2023, it's now, and it's about 50%. Because I've sat, I sit on vast amounts of data, and we can look at the answers people gave, and we can see certain patterns in the data. It goes right back to my days in, as a biologist, where we only ever looked at patterns of data because we had no idea what was going on. We looked at trends. We looked at little pictures of how things worked. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So we're now able to take a conversation and break it up into its individual um, journey and elements and start people at different parts of that conversation because we know they're going to respond in slightly different ways. So that's the future. No, it's not. It's happening now. And I will close by saying, I hate this phrase, the future is proactive conversational human computer rapport. God, bullshit, bingo. Do I, do I get a prize? <laughs> uh, I think I've spoken for 25 minutes. Um, keep going no, I've had enough. <laughs> You can ask me questions if you like. Tiny step in the conversation is. Uh, as you said, each customer is different, right? So they can reply in a different way, and that reply can propagate and have multiple uh, outcomes. Do you like yeah. to see it in this way, or is more? Okay, we have a standard uh, replies with a categorize and based on these statistics we... I, I think uh, the, the problem with a chess analogy is that someone wins and you decimate the amount of... Um, uh, yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> I'm ever so keen on that, but if it's a perpetual game of chess, then yes. I, I think um, what I'm seeing, uh, certainly in our experience, is we are pulled in to sort point solutions. So a lot of the work we do is around something we call appointment control. So uh, I don't do much after dinner speaking for this reason. So one of my favorite case studies is the work we do with Whirlpool around triage of broken washing machines. <laughs> okay, so we contact people, they've got a broken washing machine, we know that, and then we ask them to tell us the serial number and then either spoken or written describe the noise when they turn the drum round. Right? Okay. That informs people two things. It tells them if you've got the part, if you've got the serial number, you turn it with the right part because there are 100 drums in the Whirlpool range, interestingly. And, um, and by turning it around, you can tell whether it's a drive or a belt or, or what have you. So that, that's a point solution, and that job is done. And then the technician turns up and replaces it and goes away. And that's the end. Right? Now, what disappoints me about that is that should be the beginning of a, of a longer conversation. It should be a conversation about warranties. It should be a conversation about renewal of warranties. It should be a conversation about upgrading. It should be, no one from Whirlpool here, it should be a conversation about recalling that washing machine or dryer <laughs> for the danger of it burning your house down, right? So it should be the beginning. So, so in many ways, I'm doing the first move, and then there's a second move, maybe a third move, but, but the, there should be more moves later, and you should be connecting up these individual, um, uh, these individual interventions into one continuous flow, a sort of one voice of communication, if you like. But that, that will happen. I mean, that's the human condition, that's what we do. So computers are eminently suited for doing that, rather better than humans, because they don't forget. Well, sometimes they forget. Mark, on that, I mean, can I ask, uh, just sort of ask a follow-up question? Is that, does that then require uh, companies have to actually design what they want to, where they want to get to, even in almost like fuzzy terms? So they almost have to have an idea of what's, you know, what is the outcome or where the conversation needs to kind of go in order to be able to understand what they need to do in between, or can it just organically develop? I think what I describe is bleeding obvious. I just think it is the human condition. Yes. I think there are a handful of companies that see it that way, um, but by no means all. I don't underestimate the technical challenges of this. I mean, you're all here because of uh, 
uh, you know, the wonderful work of APIs. And, and, and of course, that's what it's all about. It's about connecting all these different data sets together and then bringing them and, and filtering them in some sense and getting some kind of sense out of those. And it's very, very difficult. I mean, we work with um, uh, Virgin Media, for instance, and I think they're an agglomeration of about 40 different companies over the years. So there's all sorts of different shit that you find inside the business and you kind of understand why it's broken. But aspirationally, yeah, of course. It's um, you know, one of the, the pieces of work that we do in the banking industry. When you apply for a loan, right, you pretty much get the same offer from everybody, right? Because you've got a credit rating of some sort. So the differentiation service, right? Now the banks have, uh, uh, and one might argue it's their own fault, they've had to sort of implode in the amount of people they have. So how can you have this sort of personal contact between two human beings about a mortgage, for instance? It's very difficult to do. And so it's often done badly and so loan conversion rates are really small now if you intervene with a machine to say it looks like you know can we help you or whatever else it is then you can you can help triage again the process of a loan application but ultimately you can connect two human beings together to have a conversation about debt because most people when they get into debt want a conversation with a human being now by doing that you massively increase the amount of loans you write fairly obviously and you differentiate yourself from others that don't bother to do that so it is obvious and it is happening. Yeah. Any other questions? Please introduce yourself. Yes, hi, I'm uh, Eric from SpeakUp. We're a great company. Please look us up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, how do you view this type of contextual uh, customer care in the light of the GDPR regulations? Because it, it looks like you're combining existing data sources in, in new ways. So I can imagine getting consent from the, from the customer. Prior consent can, be, can become a challenge here. <laughs> Uh, you're right, and it is a, uh, there's lots of things we don't do as a consequence of, of exactly that. But we, we only communicate with people who have given their consent, and virtually everything we do is around service conversations, which is acceptable under GDPR. As you step into the world of pulling in data from other sources, then you start, it becomes fuzzy, it becomes grey. Uh, but we are hypersensitive about it as a business. So we're ISO 27001 certified. I have more people. I can't, I can't reach anything I do anymore. I can't into anything anymore. <laughs> so we, have, we are ultra um, uh, secure in what we do. Uh, but there is an ethical issue here, particularly around the AI stuff we do, because we built our own ML. And, uh, and I'm big on explainable AI as well. I, th I think we uniquely can do that. And I say uniquely because what we do is quite simple, right? The intents you get back from a question you ask are rather restricted. If you sit there and wait for people to come in, then it's massive. And so your training challenge is enormous, which is why chatbots are, are, are rarely a great experience. Whereas if you begin a conversation, you reduce the amount of intent. So, so we, are, uh, we are learning our way through that. I, even, I bore you with what this stands for, but we even have a principle uh, around our AI called BEERS, B-W-E-R-S. One of the E's is ethical. So it's very, very important, and I'm funding a number of PhDs into this area as well. Good question. I think I swerved it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, can I ask you to... Yes, guys. Thank you very much.